All right, let's look at the fuel cell. I'm gonna start very, very basic and I'm gonna build upon the basics till we wind up with this super sophisticated, highly advanced fuel cell that's part of the kit. If we were to take and water with a little salt, potassium hydroxide, battery acid, something to act as an electrolyte, and then we apply a voltage potential, what happens is we start separating the water into monatomic hydrogen and monatomic oxygen. Now remember, the oxygen has double negative charge. So the oxygen is going to gravitate over here to the positive side to try to balance itself out. The hydrogen has a positive charge and it's going to gravitate over here to the negative side trying to electrically balance itself out. <clears throat> now, if we were to take, uh, say, an example one, we're going to put uh, uh, 12 volts and 15 amps between the cathode and the anode. And that might get us, uh, say, six liters per hour of our water gas. Incidentally, there's a chemical reaction formula for this where you apply the voltage and the amperage and you get hydrogen, oxygen, and heat. The heat is generated just like a filament of a light bulb or an electric stove. The water becomes the filament. We have threshold voltage of 1.8 3 to 1.86 volts. Once we apply a minimum of 1.83 to 1.86 volts across here, we will start to generate our gas. Anything less than this, and we cannot generate any gas. It takes a minimum 1.83 to 1.86 volts between our cathode and our anode to start the process of generating the water fuel. Now, anything over this falls into the heat factor. So if we put 12 volts across here, 15 amps of current, how do we get the 15 amps? By how much electrolyte we put in here. We put it in straight water, 12 volts, we might get, you know, 0.03 amps. What we call tap water, you know, straight water. Maybe get 0.03 amps. We start, you know, put a little salt or a little bit of potassium hydroxide, lye, and, you know, mix it in, and all of a sudden the amps will go up. The more electrolytic component we put in here, the higher the amperage draw. All right? So we tune the electrolyte for 15 amps at our 12 volts, and we'll get about 6 liters per hour, plus a lot of thermal energy, because anything over this gets converted to heat. Do you understand that? This thing's going to boil before long, because all the heat that that 12 volts is generating. But here's a magic trick. We're going to go in here, and we're going to put a plate right between these. It's called a neutral plate. And what's going to happen is we're going to get oxygens collecting on the one side of this neutral plate. We're going to get hydrogens collecting on the other side of this neutral plate. So even though it's not physically connected to anything, it will double the output. Now, our little formula becomes 12 volts, 15 amps, will give us somewhere around 11.8 liters per hour. We all but double the output, yet we didn't do anything with the voltage, we didn't do anything with the amperage, our watts consumed, our total energy consumed hasn't changed, but yet our output just down near doubled. All these materials same the cathode, the neutral plate, the anode, and all the Stainless steel. Okay. 304 stainless in the case of the fuel cell. Pretty cool trick. Let's do that sucker again. How about? There are a couple more of them babies in there.
I'm not going to continue on with the math because I just randomly grabbed numbers. Shame on me. But the HAFC fuel cell has five plates, which makes four cells. The cell is the distance between here. And it puts out 60 liters per hour. Let's take a look at the voltage here for just a second. We have 12 volts from here to here. If we measure from here to the center right here, we actually have 6 volts and 6 volts. So if we measure between e any two of these adjacent plates, we're going to have 3 volts. Simple division. We take cathode, anode, 12 volts. We throw one in the middle. Now we got two 6 volt jumps. We throw a total of three in the middle, and we have four three volt jumps. Three times four equals 12. At three volts, are we still above our threshold? Hypothetically, we could probably throw yet another plate in there and still be above our threshold, huh? So why don't we do that? Because heat. Now, when we tune the fuel cell, we're going to take a wild guess at how much electrolyte to put in there. No, it's not wild. It's actually very well thought out and it's a good starting point. But we're going to put a certain amount of electrolyte in there. And then we're going to take one of those little clamp-on amp meters and see how many amps of current that concentration of electrolyte will draw on the fuel cell. When you first turn the car on, apply voltage to the cell, even if the electrolyte is spot on, we're targeting 15 amps. But when you first turn it on, you may only be drawing 8 amps. Sometimes it's gone down as low as 6 amps. But don't start dumping more electrolyte in trying to get your 15 amps. Let it run for 20 minutes or a half hour and come back and check and you might be at 16 or 16 and a half amps. You might have to actually pull some out and just put distilled water back in to bring the amperage down. So we can increase the efficiency by adding heat. So we run it right here, we're very, very inefficient. At this threshold, we do not have a whole lot of efficiency. So we need to put more voltage than threshold across this so that we do generate some heat, so that we do get the volume up. It makes the unit more efficient. So these fuel cells will have battery voltage, and we're going to tune them for 15 amps. And the new revised version, which is underneath that blanket up there, is going to have actually two of these. Each will have its own feed, own relay, own fuse. So if you're doing like a four-cylinder engine, you only use one side of it. If you're doing a V8, you actually hook up both sides. But each side has a total of five plates, four cells. Any questions on this as far as what I've covered so far? The, the, the volts that we're shooting for that we want to come out of that is 1.83 to 1.86? No, that's threshold. That is a point of reference. This is just chalk it away in the back of your mind just in case you ever get on a game show and they ask you this. But this is what it takes to start the process. It's nowhere near the that's most the efficient range to operate at. Yeah, right. But this is this, anything less than this, you're not going to get squat. Okay. At this, you're going to get a little bit. Up at the range that we're operating at with the, the water fuel cell, we're getting a whole lot more than this will deliver. So this is just, like I said, just a number to randomly throw in the back of your notes. It's not on the test. I don't think it is. Any other questions? Okay. <clears throat> this is how we're making those single hydrogen, single oxygen, free-floating atoms that are going to help us to create OH radicals that are going to help us to convert big molecules into carbon dioxide and water vapor quicker. We're going to be able to convert more of the chemical energy to kinetic energy. Now, um, diagnostic would be pretty much crucial for, for efficiency, maximum efficiency to make sure that like 12 and at least 15 amps is there at that that fuel yeah, battery, we're just tuned for 15 amps. Um, if you have high voltage, you might want to tune it for like 14.2, 14.5. If you have low voltage, you might go 15 and a half volts. Um, there's a process where you can actually check. How do we come up with that 60 liters per hour? We take two one liter bottles, fill one with water, 
and then the other one should be empty, which this one is not, but nevertheless. And then you can see that tube running down to the bottom. Um, we're going to take and run that one over to this bottle, and then this hose, which just goes inside the lid and stops, we're going to hook up to our fuel cell. Then we're going to activate the fuel cell. As soon as that fuel cell starts generating the gases, it will try to escape. Those gases have to go somewhere. It generates a little bit of a pressure. That pressure then is forced into the top here. Putting pressure on top of the water is going to force the water down here to go up through this tube and discharge into this other container. So if we know one liter of water here, how long does it take to empty it? All right? We're looking for about 60 liters per hour. So for one liter. <laughs> that would be one liter per minute, right? 60 minutes in an hour, so one liter per minute. Very good. Some quick shortcut on the math here. If it takes 60 seconds to do one liter, that would be 60 liters per hour. That one's easy. Now, what happens if it takes 55 seconds to do one liter? If it takes 55 seconds, it took less than the full minute, which means it's putting out more than 60 liters per hour, right? Because it took less time to do the same amount of work, so therefore it's doing more work in the same amount of time. So, very good, awesome, 65 liters per hour. Conversely, if it takes 62 seconds to give us one liter, yep, 58. So basically for every second off of 60 in one direction or the other, it's going to affect us by one liter per hour. One second, one liter. So it takes two seconds longer, that's two liters less than the 60. If we can do it in five seconds less, that's five liters more per hour as far as rating the system. Don't worry guys, after you get your cars all hooked up, we're going to actually do this. Now, this whole process of checking the output. Is this another something that you file away in the back of your memory to never worry about, or is this actually something that you're going to use? Yes, that's the question. When would you use it? Every time you do an install? Yeah. I wouldn't. Yeah. Screw that, man. I'm a businessman. If I start out with a clean, fresh fuel cell, and I start out with uh, distilled water, I know my fuel <laughs> cell's clean, I got distilled water, and I tuned for my 15 amps, that guarantees the I'm in this range. Whether I'm putting out 55 or 65 liters per hour, I'm in the range. So when would I use that little test? When I can't get the thing tuned, I want to start off with knowing how much HHO I'm putting out. You can do that, but again, all right, let's say that you've done 10 and you're familiar with the process, you're comfortable with the process, uh, you start shortcutting stuff. It's just like if you look in, in, the, in the time and labor guide as to how long it takes to do a certain operation, um, if you've been doing it for a while, you're beating that time pretty, pretty quick. You may go to the Mac tool guy and buy a little simple tool that takes this much time and now you can do it in this much time, you make more money on flat rate. This is the same thing. You're gonna make, you know, do this a couple of times and you start shortcutting the process. I am not doing an output test every time I do an install. Don't need to. But where you are going to want to do an output test is let's say nine months later a customer comes back and says, look, I'm just, the mileage ain't there. You know, I've been keeping an eye on the level and everything like I'm supposed to and I've been adding it and, you know, I, I don't know what to do. I don't understand the system. So you go in there, none of the wires came loose, there's no corrosion, the optimizer's working properly, there's no fuel leaks. Tune-up's all looking beautiful, you throw it on the scope, you're not getting any codes, so you're back to suspecting the fuel cell. Right or wrong, you're going to suspect the fuel cell. So how do you verify if it is or is not the fuel cell? Does it make sense? Does it make sense? 
Check, see if you're drawing 15 amps. See if you're, you know, putting out. So let's take a little scenario. This is a troubleshooting scenario. Two years, nine months, whatever, customer comes back, it's not working. So you got your uh, cell here, you know, with your plates in there. You're a little off gas here. <clears throat> you put your amp meter on there and it's drawing like 20 amps. 20 amps of current, but you're not getting but maybe two or three liters per hour coming out here. Most like, excuse me, most likely what happened is the customer was not using distilled water and that which was in the water is building up on the bottom and shorting out the plates. Now, if you short out the plates, you can draw 50 amps and not put a half a liter out an hour, huh? So this, this, this little test becomes a diagnostic tool down the road. I assure you, if you got a clean fuel cell, you're using distilled water and you get the 15 amps, you don't have to do that test on every install. You want to do it once or twice while you're, you know, getting your feet wet with it, great. What happens if they forget to put the distilled water in a couple of times and it runs dry? Okay, what happens if the fuel cell runs dry, the amps go away, the output goes away, and so does the mileage increase. It won't hurt the unit at all. It'll reactivate as soon as they put the distilled yeah, water yeah. back in. Nice thing about this process, all right, we do the tuning process, 15 amps, the thing's putting out, 60 liters per hour, all right? And uh, you live in Minnesota. So you stop somewhere in Ohio, you check it. And it's about this far below the line. You want to top it off. You top it off with just distilled water. The electrolyte remains in the container. So as the water level goes down because we're converting it into water gas, the concentration of the electrolyte goes up. So whether you got this much water in there or this much water in there, chances are your amperage draw won't be that much different because you still have the same concentration. So a weak concentration up here, you got a lot of surface area of plates being exposed to the water. So you draw 15 amps. But then as the water's consumed, you have less and less surface area exposed to the plates, but your, your salinity, your, your concentration of electrolyte makes it easier to pass voltage through. It conducts electricity better. So the old trick on the early models, if any of you are familiar with the early ones that had the little amp gauge, that thing doesn't move until you're bone dry and then it just zeroes out. So it's not like, well, it's drawing 15 amps now, when it gets down to 12, I'll add water. <laughs> doesn't work that way. So you have to actually, you know, visually do your water level inspection on these periodically. If they do have buildup, how do you get it out for them? <laughs> okay, let's assume that uh, you're, you're, you're drawing 55 amps, blowing fuses left and right, not getting any output. Physically remove the unit, wearing gloves, eye protection, skin protection, because this is a caustic material. Potassium hydroxide is just as harmful to our neutral pH bodies as hydrochloric acid is. It's just on the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> so anyhow, you remove the unit and you dispose of what's in there properly and then rinse it with water, empty it. Rinse it with water, empty it. By the way, potassium hydroxide is drain cleaner, so going down the drain is perfectly safe. And, and anything else is in there that was probably from the tap water. So again, down the drain is perfectly safe. Rinse it with water quite a few times, shaking it up and just trying to break it loose. You'll get a lot loose, but you'll look down in there and you'll see oh, there's still a residue. Take like white vinegar and pour white vinegar in there. Probably diluted with water and shake it up a couple of times and then maybe increase it to straight white vinegar and shake it up. And that white vinegar will act against the caustics because vinegar is a mild acid. So after you've gotten as much of the caustic out as you can just by rinsing it with water, putting a little bit of vinegar in there will actually attack the, 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 the residual residue in there and break it loose and chemically alter it so it comes loose. You get the thing cleaned out, then you just start from scratch. You know, water and, and, and potassium hydroxide, do your amp check, your output test, make sure everything's functioning good. Got it?
All right. On page 14, <clears throat> heating the fuel. You know what? I'm going to pass these around. These are the old fuel cells, and these are still being shipped. So I say old, that means there's something better in the works, but this is what's still being shipped. You look inside here, there's uh, this plate. There's a, well, four threaded holes, a small hole in the bottom, and a little bit bigger hole in the top. All right? The four threaded holes are going to be to mount the plates in here. The plates are spaced apart with this plastic, and then there's a rubber O-ring that goes inside of here. So when it's all put together, it'll look kind of like this. And I'll pass these around. Now, you look at the plates, and it has those same kind of holes. The bigger one at the top and the smaller one at the bottom. The one at the bottom is so liquid can seek its own level. Because the back side of this is your water reservoir. That's where you fill it. And then the water goes through this lower hole and equalizes between the, the five plates. This plate being one of them. This plate is your, all right, who took notes? Yeah, cathode or anode. The whole housing's grounded, so which one got the minus sign? Cathode. The cathode? Okay. So this is your cathode plate here. And then your water is going to seek its own level through this little hole. And as the unit produces the water gas, it's going to pass between the plates through this hole, where it will go back into the water side and come out the top through this port. Right here. Any questions on that that you think won't be answered by the time it gets to you? Yes, sir. Just a little off. If we're getting a lot of foaming out of the tank, mm -hmm. is that because maybe we're too high in the level and we've blocked off that upper hole? Uh, if you're getting a lot of foaming in the tank, chances are that you have a high voltage alternator. Uh, if we were to take a voltmeter out here and check all the cars in the parking lot, the output's going to range from probably 12.9 on a pretty weak setup to as much as probably 15.8 volts. And so if you've got a high voltage, then you might want to drop the amperage down to like 14 and a half amps or something. Um, temperature of the unit will make a difference also. So if you have it mounted like right up tight against a radiator or heater hose or something, um, doesn't get any airflow, it'll be more apt to foam than if it's somewhere mounted cooler. Okay, so the water level won't well, yeah, I mean, you're going to get foaming inside, and, and um, you know what? <coughs> Since you're passing these around, let me make one little mark on here. This is the water level. Since you guys already looked at that, look, we're about a half inch below the nipple. Mm -hmm. Any higher than that, almost guaranteed, it'll foam. Now, while these are being passed around, take note also, let me borrow this just a sec, where these plates are. If you're going to put a bracket on this and you're going to drill, you drill into this side, you drill into the liquid side. Your propensity to leak is great. If you drill into this side, you notice that you have the corners free and clear and open. So you can drill anywhere in the corners. Once the plate is welded on, I'll show you that unit, once the plate is welded on, if you're going to weld to it, weld to the dry side. You can weld anywhere as long as you're not penetrating in and attacking the internal plates. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of get an idea of how the plates are spaced. So if you're going to drill and tap and put screws in there, you know where. And then this... Sounds like you guys use like primes. <clears throat> Pardon? You guys use clamps on the two cars outside. Yeah, you can in use space. clamps. Um, drilling. Well, see, it's, it's a difference in some people just want to get the job done, know that it's safe, and get it out, and they would use clamps. Some people want it to look fancy, so they'll weld to it, or they'll, you know, drill and tap and, and more securely mount. Is there a right way and a wrong way? Safe, upright, and secure is the right way. 
But if you're going to drill and tap, you know, I want to show you where. I'm going to start this and back here and treat you guys because I keep starting everything up front. Then just zig it and zag it and pass it forward. What happens if you drill it? So you're short it out, you actually pump one of those plates with a screw if you don't hit the corners while you pump the plate. Yeah, you're going to short it out because. Pardon? Question. Uh, if uh, we have a, like a, a, like a, the junk just a build up between these plates, how we can flush it off with this? Okay, you're not going to have liquid over here. See how this hose is coming through here? This is all dry because you have those plastic spacers and O-rings. This is your wet side. This is your dry side. I can fill this with water and this will all remain dry because the plates get the water between them through the little pinhole that I showed you at the bottom. Oh, and then the gaskets use it just... <laughs> this, whole, this whole side here is dry. There's no liquid over on this side. That's why it's okay to drill on this side and not that side. I, but man, thanks for bringing that up. I did not make that clear. Yeah, so you put water in here, this stays dry. If you feel in here, you can feel about how far apart they're spaced. That little plastic spacer that I passed around is what determines that thickness. And you can see we have a big heavy plate for our anode. That, that the water on calcium is going to go right between that thing. Right between the plates, right. But see, on these units, once that last piece is welded in, you cannot take them apart and clean them. That's why you have to, you know, fill with water, shake, dump it, fill with water, shake, dump it, and then add a little vinegar to go in there and break it loose, and then, you know, a couple more times. So these, these current units are not serviceable. The newer ones, which are under here, I'm not sure if they're going to be serviceable or not, but you'll at least be able to get access to the plates. Whoo! wow, did everybody catch that? That there is a dry side and a wet side? There's no water in here. There's no nothing. This is all air. After the unit's all welded together, this is air. The liquid is between the plates, but it gets between the plates through those little pinholes that I told you about. So oh. that, that plate yeah, keeps yeah, it from get, coming to the other side. Right. So, I mean, you, you can cut a hole in here, and you aren't going to leak any. Assuming that this is doing its job and it's yeah. sealing properly, yeah. you won't have any liquid over here at all. So actually, there's no need for that to be covered. Right. Other than the fact that you don't want something to touch it or whatever. Dun dun dun! Drum roll! Dun dun dun! Oh wow! How do I? Okay, this is the new system. <laughs> now for this one, instead of passing stuff around, I'm going to ask you to come up because this just doesn't fit between the aisles. Come on up, guys. So this centerpiece here is the negative plate. That's the cathode. It comes down, it's welded to the mounting plate. So that grounds out this system. And then this far end plate and this far end plate become our anode. These are our positive plates. So from the center over is the same as that big bulky fuel cell that we've been passing around. From the center over that way is like a second fuel cell, both of them being combined into a much smaller, lightweight package. Everyone got that? All right. <clears throat> this is the reservoir where the electrolyte goes. It's gravity fed down through here so that through those little pinholes in the bottom, it'll find its way the whole way across between every one of the plates. And then the gases will come out the top. And then instead of having a dryer, which the current units have, a dryer, it just dumps back into the reservoir. The current units have this little gizmo here so that occasionally you have to take the lid off and you have to empty out the liquids that got sucked up into the output of the fuel cell. Basically empty back it. Well, now you don't have to empty anything. Furthermore, instead of having the little bit of capacity that that jacket has to hold water where you got to check it about every tank, this should probably go a whole month without having to add even on a vehicle where someone drives a lot. We've combined this plus the liquid side of this into this. These we can manufacture for less than this and this does twice the work. This is an awful lot of welding because this is a plate, this is a plate, this is a plate, this is a plate. There's all the plates on the inside. Everything has to be welded. You don't want to get the liquid over into the dry side and then they put another plate. That's a lot simpler. 
Hmm. One weld. Hmm. One weld. And the right along the bottom. You don't have the outside casing around that. You know? Right. You can do it and plastic. That. You can do it just protective something. something. There, there is a protect. Um, yeah, something like this. Okay. Yeah, the. the that's just a magnet. <laughs> he still my beating heart. Yeah, so there is some, because, I mean, you're going to have battery voltage exposed out here. So this yeah, is just something that kind of. Dust, coal, whatever. Yeah. Right. So you don't bump up against it with a screwdriver or something. So, this is a solenoid. What's it do? Since there's no automatic float system, when you turn the key off, this shuts off. You turn the key on, now you're generating gases in here. You're building up some pressure in here. The pressure is going to push out the top and push down on the bottom, equal and opposite. And so even though you have pressure pushing in here, the gases will keep that air pocket that's necessary at the top. I don't even know if this is necessary, but it's in here right now on these early prototypes. Like I said, they're not even shipping this setup yet. We're still finalizing design work and so forth, but this just hooks up to the key, so when you turn the key on, it opens up and allows the liquid down in. Now, if you're doing a four-cylinder, you hook up just one of the leads. If you're doing an eight-cylinder, you hook up both of the leads. The question was asked, well, what happens if you hook them both up on a four-cylinder? <laughs> Your charging system. If your charging system can handle it, go for it. But remember, that car is going to be sitting at a traffic light with an automatic transmission in drive with the defroster motor going on high with the AC clutch kicking in because that's what happens when it's on defrost. Plus, you're going to have the wipers going on high because it's raining. The headlights are going to be on. So the alternator has to carry that load plus the fuel cell. So use a little common sense. I mean, we all want the biggest, baddest, you know, highest output, but use a little reason and, and, and think it through. And if, if you feel confident that, you know, it's got a 125 amp alternator on it, yeah, no problem. We put this, uh, one pickup truck, V8, went from 18 to 33. Another pickup truck went from 13 to 33. 33 miles per gallon in a four-wheel drive. One would be better with the dual units on it? It has the potential to be better, yeah. These trucks that were getting 33 miles per gallon is because people who understood this kind of stuff took the time to properly tune for what they had. So that means that if you were to have this on a four-cylinder, instead of going from 13 to 33, you might go from 38 to 121. Is that what was on the yeah. side of that car? Yeah. Yes, sir? I understood that on some of the V8s, they had to put two of those in mm -hmm. in order to you know, have sufficient capacity. It makes it easier. Yeah, large engines, it's easier to uh, you know, accomplish your goals with you know, twice the capacity. And that's why they, they went with this. But I, I wouldn't hesitate to put a single unit like this on a V8. It's still doable. So does everybody understand this? We're going to take this and run it to the base of the air cleaner just like we would you know, coming off of this. See how the hose comes straight up on this? Because if you're going to get mild foaming going on in here, gravity will pull it back down. Whereas if you just came off on an angle, if you get the foam up this far, it's going to get pushed out the rest of the way. Whereas this, if you get a little foam, it might just drop back down. So then we go into the lower side of our dryer. Hopefully gravity will pull it down and only the light vapors will be able to move on to the air cleaner. Incidentally, on the air cleaner, this is where the air filter goes. Down below that is where we're putting our water gas in. So we're creating water gas and sometimes a little bit of soapy kind of electrolyte solution that might get pushed out. By the way, potassium hydroxide KOH, potassium hydroxide, is what we're using for our electrolyte. And if you mix potassium hydroxide and aluminum, you get a fairly radical chemical reaction because the potassium hydroxide mix will eat away at that aluminum ferociously. 
And the chemical process for that is you get aluminum plus potassium hydroxide, you get aluminum oxide and hydrogen and heat. We don't want the stuff that's in here getting into our aluminum engines. So, avoid foaming, build a little trap, let the air filter catch any that might have gotten through our first trap. And then in this system over here, same thing, <clears throat> except now this is our trap. Okay, one more time. <laughs> this is our trap. Hydrogen gas, well, um, water fuel comes out here, goes in the top, and then comes out here, goes into the bottom of our air cleaner. Same principle. Any questions on how that's rigged up? Did you say that it goes on the engine side of that filter or the before the, the ambient side? You want the paper element to act as a final barrier for any of the, the caustic solution that may have got that far. Hopefully it won't, but if it does, at least that paper filter element will, will keep it from getting sucked into our aluminum component engines. Yes, sir? Getting up into your, uh, I don't know what they have in there. I showed up here at about uh, two minutes after nine this morning, saw that for the first time, got a quick rundown on it, you know, in the back room. I had already been on the phone talking to him about it, so I kind of had an idea what was working. I don't know what's going to be in the production version either, because like I said, this is what's still being shipped. Any other questions? Okay. Page 11, at least in his book. Let me see if it matches up in mine. Ah, yep, page 11 in mine too. Yep, same picture. Holy smokes. All right. Um... I got sidetracked. I don't know how I did that, but I got sidetracked. <laughs> Heating the fuel, uh, page 14, we have as part of the kit something we call a vaporizer. You can see the vaporizer in this illustration is strapped to the upper radiator hose. Um, heater hoses would be better. If you could like take, you know, your heater hoses and just kind of get this between the two like that. For one, you're going to start getting heat to this before the thermostat opens. Your thermostat has to open before that starts working. Heater hoses, as quick as the engine builds it, you're getting it, all right? Um, with this comes a thermal wrap and some pretty high temp, high pressure plastic line and fancy clamps and stuff to rig this up. This is not directional. The fuel can flow this way or this way. Doesn't matter. Now, we want maximum heat in this. And the fact of the matter is, is if you actually test the temperature of the fuel coming out of this, it does not add that much. We'd like to think it's coolant temperature, but it's way less. <clears throat> At least on recirculation systems, we got constantly flowing. Deadhead systems, like, you know, a lot of the later model stuff, they don't have a return line. And it dwell, your dwell time, it sits there and absorbs more heat before it gets to the fuel rail. So they seem to do a little better as far as how much temperature we can get into the fuel. But vaporizing the fuel, this will elevate the thermal energy of the fuel so that we can phase change more of it to a vapor. Liquid fuel doesn't burn, right? I mean, all that OH radical crap that we did, that's attacking molecules. And if we've got a liquid, we can't even get to the molecules. We got this barrier of a whole bunch of molecules clumped together where they're just untouchable. So you look at the vapor points on page 14. And if we have the fuel coming through the injector at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, we're going to vaporize some of that stuff because remember, it's going into a low pressure intake manifold that's under a vacuum the majority of the time. But what happens if we could uh, send it in at, say, 160 degrees Fahrenheit? 
we'd vaporize a whole lot more of that fuel, wouldn't we? And the more fuel we can vaporize, the quicker we can get those OH radicals in there starting to the combustion process. Because normally what happens in a normal engine is the fuel goes in there, only that which is vaporized, when that spark plug goes off, actually starts the burning process. If it's liquid, the burn will go right past it, bounce back and then, you know, catch it on the second round or third round or maybe not at all. But we, we, we burn some of the fuel, the, the hexanes and the heptanes, that light vapor stuff that turns to a vapor, the spark plug goes off, that's what it starts burning. And it starts generating heat. The heat then will start vaporizing the octanes and the nonanes and the decanes. And as they vaporize, then they start burning and generating heat, which then starts to vaporize the undecanes and the dodecanes and whatever else. So if we can get more of it vaporized, we can get that compound bow effect kicked in because we're going to consume more of that fuel faster. Do you follow that? Are we going to vaporize all of it? Not with this setup, but we can vaporize more of it. Add some thermal energy to the fuel, we vaporize more of it. Now, we have a nice, excuse me, metal housing on there. Um, gosh, if we're not getting a whole lot of heat from the cooling system, I bet we could get a whole bunch off the exhaust system, huh, guys? Yeah, I thought about that. Yeah, strap it to the daggone downpipe, and man, we'll be vaporizing all kinds of fuel. And vaporizing fuel pumps and vaporizing injectors and, and vaporize, that's not a good idea in other words. That's too much. <laughs> the fuel itself would love to see 450, 500 degrees coming through that injector, but unfortunately the injector can't handle that much. And if you've got a recirculation system where you're going to run it through this vaporizer or run it across the fuel rail through a regulator back to the tank, you want 500 degree fuel riding back here in that fuel tank? I don't either. So we're, we're, you know, I mean, the science says, man, just, just strap it to the exhaust pipe. But the reality of it is we don't have vehicles that are designed for that kind of heat in the fuel. We're going to kill fuel pumps. We're going to kill injectors and possibly our customers doing that stupid stuff. So keep it to engine coolant. The more engine coolant um, thermal energy heat that you can get into the fuel, the better. If you want to take heater hose and literally wrap it around that aluminum housing and then pack fiberglass insulation around there and duct tape it, make it look ugly as can be, but get a lot of that thermal energy into the fuel, yeah, but let's limit it to coolant temperatures because all of the injectors on the market are going to be more than capable of handling the 230 to 240 degrees maximum coolant temperature of an engine. The fuel pump is going to be capable of handling that kind of temperature. And as long as you can keep the tank pressures to a, a reasonable level where it doesn't just explode from internal pressure, not even with the flame, just, you know, as long as you can keep the tank pressures reasonable, then anything coolant temperature is fine. Yeah, you want to get exotic, run coils through the fuel tank and run engine coolant right through there and heat it back there at the source. It's been done before and it does work, but that's a lot of work and it's not part of the kit. Yes, sir. Uh, just looking at this, um, my th the thinking being if there, if there were an adapter for the heater hose, mm -hmm. like a piece of aluminum, you just that would put you right in line with the fuel line wherever it was. You wouldn't have to do a lot of you know, you could just cut that thing and then it would be here. You stick your thing on there with the aluminum in and put two clamps on it and you, you've got it sitting right next to your gas line. You just put it right in there. What's the unit inside the hose? Huh? Well, that would be another metal. It wouldn't be rubber. All right. Um, when you recommend improvements to the kit, they would be made to Rick. Now, the vaporizer is something that we intend to improve upon down the road, just like this will improve upon this. The whole kit is going to constantly undergo an evolution. So if there's any of you out there that are just waiting for the best one before you buy, you're going to be waiting two years, three years, five years. And, you, and, and if that's your attitude, I want to know that you're driving at least an 07 automobile. Because if you've got an 06, you aren't driving the best. 
because every year it get better, right? Well, this kid is going to evolve. I mean, we're, we're, we're starting out with what we started out with. And a year and a half ago, when this kit was first being put together, there was no electronic controls. The weakest link in the chain was the electronics. And under the gun, we put out the best we could in the time frame that we had, which was the 1X. And then the 2X just had a little minor improvement in it. And then we had a little bit more time. We got the 3X together. Is it perfect? No, otherwise there wouldn't be a 4X. But there's one coming. Is this perfect and ideal? It works. The 1X works. This works a little better. The 4X is going to work a little better than the 3X, which works better than the 2X. The vaporizer that we're currently using works. Is it ideal? No. I mean, every class recommendations, well, you could make it better by doing this, and you can make it better by doing that, and oh, yeah, we could, and we're trying, and we're working on it. And we're trying to go after the weakest link in the chain, the weakest link in the chain, and just keep improving the whole system, weakest link in the chain at a time. What's the most critical to be addressed right now? That's what we're working on right now. <laughs> yeah. You know, a year from now, there are going to be all kinds of new cool stuff out there. Like computer chip. Six months is old. Right. So, that's the thing. You know, what we saved going from this design to this design gives me the freedom to make the new optimizer better. Because costs on that optimizer got out of hand. We started out with a little $10 1X. And that was fine. 10 bucks absorbed into the price of the kit, not a problem. Boy, we smoked that 10 bucks though. I'm telling you, man. The 4X combined with the ammo box. Oh, you think that looks fancy. Where do you see what the labels look like? This was just what the electronics guy put on here. Looks kind of lame. Nah, man. Yeah, that looks better. <laughs> let's take a container and let's fill it up to the very, 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 very tippy, tippy top of that container. So much so that the water actually bows up above the top of the container a little bit. <clears throat> So we have a container we're going to fill with water. We might have to use an eyedropper or a teaspoon or something, but we're actually going to overfill it. We can actually have the water level sitting up above the rim of that container. Have you all seen that happen? Mm -hmm. Water tension. Water tension. So e even though gravity says it should start spilling off the edges, it'll stay. For one class, I took a container, styrofoam cup, and I went up to the desk at the hotel and I said, I need a sewing kit. Not a problem, Mr. Holler. And I just pulled the straight, you know, the needle out. And I brought it in with me and I actually got that needle to float on the top of the water. Were you in that class? You were in that class? I got a needle floating on water, a steel needle, not a cork needle, a steel needle. The water tension was so strong that I could, it took me three, four times, kept dropping it in. But eventually I got that needle to float on that water. You guys see that there's plenty of magnets in this building. I took magnets and put them around the edge of the container. Magnets reduce surface tension. Styrofoam cup. The needle with the magnets on there, the reduced surface tension, the needle broke through and floated to the bottom. And someone in that class said, you suck that thing down through. Because the magnet acted on the needle. I said, well, maybe I did. So I guess I won't go through that hassle again. So I said, well, OK. Maybe that was not right. But if, if, if we have water in here, let's actually 
put it down at a reasonable level and skip the needle. And we put a thermometer in here. Put it on a stove. Heat it up. We're close to sea level. The water will boil at 100 degrees Celsius to 112 degrees Fahrenheit, right? In that same class, I said, now let's put magnets around the container. Magnets will reduce the surface tension, therefore should reduce the boiling point of that water, right? There was someone in the class that said, I tried that. Do you remember what he said the results were? He said he took the boiling, in his experiment, he took the boiling point from 212 down to 209. I don't know how many magnets he put on there, but the fact is, is that he was able to confirm that the magnets reduced the surface tension of the water to the point where he could observe the boiling point dropping from 212 Fahrenheit to 209 Fahrenheit. Why is that significant? Because I can't catch very well. But there's magnets inside the fuel vaporizer. I did not put much credence into magnets because I heard some people getting three, four, five miles per gallon, other people not getting anything, and other people losing a mile or two per gallon. But I found out there's a trick to it. Because the magnetic field if we were to lay paper over this and put the metal filings on it, this touching this has an effect on that magnetic flux field. And so a lot of people would put their cow magnets or whatever on metal fuel line. Doesn't work because the metal carries that flux outwardly. And if that metal happens to be strapped to the underside of the body going back to the tank, that body grounds out that whole magnetic field, they didn't do anything. For it to work properly, it has to be isolated. Rubber fuel line or plastic here and here. And you see, you know, up on the board there, page, uh, whatever the heck it was in the book, 11. 11. page 11, it's strapped to a rubber coolant line. Whether it's the upper radiator hose or heater hoses. In other words, these magnets are not grounded out to the body. They're isolated to this housing. That's what makes it, well, that's half the problem. That's half of it. The other half is, is the north-south polarity. And I don't even know what it is in here. You know what? I don't care. I don't need to know because they got it right. They did their research. They put this together, and this has given us results. In fact, we had one vehicle. This and the optimizer, and he got a 45% increase in fuel economy without even the fuel cell. That's what I was Just thinking. this. And a 3X optimizer got a 45% increase in fuel economy. This works. Any questions? So it would be advisable to put that on metal in heater hose, heater line. It would not be advisable. That is correct. It would not be advisable to strap this to a metal heater line. Like if you have a band that has rear heat. <laughs> oh, you were here when that was here? <laughs> Chevy Astro looking thing. Now this is, this is the caustic, it's uh, potassium hydroxide. In fact, I'm going to write that down. That is on the test. What is the caustic that's used? The caustic is KOH is the symbol where K is the chemical symbol for potassium, O is the chemical symbol for oxygen, and H is the symbol for hydrogen. <laughs> so K has three little empty arms. Two of them are going to attract an oxygen and the last one's going to be attracted to a hydrogen. KOH, potassium hydroxide. Now, <clears throat> again, along the lines of giving you more than you really need to know, 
Potassium hydroxide is a dry powder or chunks, little like salt granules. Potassium hydroxide. Once you mix this potassium hydroxide with water as an electrolyte, it now becomes potassium hydride. Potassium hydride. Potassium hydroxide, potassium hydride. And I don't know exactly how to write it out. I know how to say it, but I don't know how to write it. But you take potassium hydroxide plus water yields potassium hydride and lots of heat. I'm telling you this because lots of heat means lots and lots and lots of heat. So you take a styrofoam <clears throat> cup like this or a plastic container like this and you start pouring the potassium hydroxide in here, you're going to melt this thing. I kid you not, it'll melt right through this water bottle. It makes that much heat. And you won't be able to hold, you know, even if you have a metal container and you're trying to hold it and dump it in, you're not going to hold on to that metal container long. It'll literally boil the water. It gets that hot. So A, when you mix, add it slow. A teaspoon or tablespoon, mix it up, let it do its thing. When it calms down, add another tablespoon, let it do its thing. And to start out in the tuning process, we're going to have uh, two and a half cups of water to three tablespoons of um, potassium hydroxide. Two and a half cups water, three tablespoons. That's your starting point. Mixed up in a glass container. Glass will not react. If I took this aluminum can and I poured water in it and I poured the potassium hydroxide in, it'll eat right through the bottom of that can and spill the caustic all over the place. We usually use cold water. It ain't going to stay cold for long, is what no, I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> it does get, yeah. Olives, you, you use pretty much the same so you use a, a glass container when you do your mixing. Mix it slowly. Caustic will blind you. Eye protection. Caustic will eat through your skin, leave blisters, nasty chemical burns. Wear rubber gloves. Protect yourself. This is no joke, guys. I mean, this is nasty stuff that you're dealing with here. It's regulated. I mean, it's... Protect yourselves. So, um, any questions on the fuel heater or the fuel cell? How much... Uh, yes, sir. Mike, uh, we've been playing back there. And actually, we're starting with two level tablespoons and two and a half cups. And two and tablespoons and first? I don't know if it's a different batch of chemical or what it is. And then once you get it in, you let it run for 20 minutes or so, and then you go back and you check the amps, and if it needs, you know, a little bit more to bring the amps up, then you put another half tablespoon in or whatever. We're actually going to do the mixing on the vehicle. I'm abbreviating now. We'll go into it a little bit more in depth because you will do this. You'll have the amp meter on there, you'll actually, you know, mix it, put it in. You mix it in a separate container, then you add it in, and if you need to add more caustic, then you actually pull some out, put it in your metal container, add it, mix it, and then put it back in again. You don't want to be pouring the caustic directly in there. Uh, if you need to lean it out some, it's drawing too many amps, you pull some of the caustic out, and then just, you can pour the water in here, that's fine, you know. Okay, if you mix it in glass, it cools down. Can you put it into plastic? Yeah, as long as the plastic itself is uh, chemically compatible. And I don't know chemistry. I just, I make it sound like I do up here, but I'm really not a chemist. Okay, then I just take Most it. plastic should be compatible, gloss. but yes. not all will yeah, be. Keep it in the, in, the, in the glass bottle. That's you can keep it in the glass bottle, too. This is drain cleaner. I mean, um, I think it's been outlawed in most states, but you used to be able to buy Red Devil Lye. Red Devil Drain Cleaner. <laughs> um, potassium hydroxide is called lye. Sodium hydroxide is also called lye. The Red Devil Drain Cleaner is sodium hydroxide. The potassium hydroxide pH is just a hair, you know, more caustic. Works just a hair better. But as far as 
How you would, how would you treat lye as a drain cleaner? You'd protect yourself and, you know, I mean, of course, you can dump down the drain. So instead of storing already mixed stuff, you know, you could pour it out or whatever. I saw a couple of hands. Um, yes, sir. I pulled out a hot mix that was too strong and put it in like a Mountain Dew soda bottle and labeled it hot mix. Mm -hmm. so, and I've had it on the bench for, for two months now and it hasn't had any reaction. Okay. So. He said that he had um, uh, diluted the mix, pulled some out, put it in a Mountain Dew, plastic Mountain Dew bottles, had it out there for about two months and it's still fine. 